Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Uh, today, uh, we are very happy and honored to be able to welcome Dr. Mark Winborn uh, as our guest on the podcast. We are going to talk about metaphor. Uh, of course, psychoanalysis has as its basis language. And with language, metaphor comes along in fairy tales and and symbols and the very live process that takes place between two people in the consulting room. Mark is a member of the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts. He teaches at the C.G. Jung Institute in Zurich. He does a lot of work internationally. He has published three books. The most recent is Interpretation in Jungian Analysis, and there's much more. So uh, please, if you're interested, take a look at his website, drmarkwinborn.com, spelled just like it sounds. So with that, let's launch into our conversation. Thank you, Deborah. I really appreciate it. I just used a metaphor. I said, let's you launch. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, once you start seeing them, you can't stop. <laughs> Right. Yeah, well, it's really nice to have you, Mark. I mean, Mark was one of our teachers in training, so that's always a special treat for us. Yeah. Yeah, I was mentioning that to a friend last night, that it, it, it interesting uh, coming into this format and seeing this wonderful thing that the three of you have created and that it's really grown by leaps and bounds in such a short period of time. Yeah, we're in a really interesting place where... Um... We have about 200,000 downloads a month, and we're up to 4 million downloads uh, total, which is just seems miraculous to all of us. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's, that's amazing. And I think it's a tribute to Jung's ideas and yes. how hungry people are to hear more about them. So mm -hmm. yeah. it's really a pleasure for us to be able to provide a <laughs> place for analysts like you mm -hmm. to bring their work to the wider public. We are really standing on the shoulders of a lot of people. So talk to us, Mark, about metaphor. You and I were just chatting for a minute about the aesthetics of metaphor, but and how much the, the feeling tone of something lovely, beautiful, on point, how important that can be. Absolutely. Uh, and I think, you know, in our work as analysts, uh, it's very easy to get caught up in what's wrong, what, what might be termed pathological, what's gotten distorted, uh, what's wounded. And there is another dimension about the analytic experience, and certainly I hope for everyone about life, the aesthetic experience of life, and that we are really 
processing in a different way when we attend to the aesthetics of how somebody sighs, the mm -hmm. aesthetics of what another work that I did, uh, the moments of meeting around beauty, where the words that are used fall in such close conjunction with the feelings that are in the room. Mm -hmm. And to think of it as not just a healing process, but also this really aesthetic beauty that's being created in the moment, not unlike what we'd see on stage with beautiful choreography. Yeah, that, that really resonates, uh, that, that sense that some different realm has been touched into that is deeply integrative and beautiful. And I, I appreciate what you're saying about, you know, sort of the other side of pathology. I think so much about mental health can be about what's wrong. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that has always been meaningful to me about a Jungian approach, and in fact is what drew me to a Jungian approach, is that it does look for and value and cultivate that which is transcendent, meaningful, and beautiful. Yeah, and there, there's certainly elements of that in other psychoanalytic models, but it's certainly present in the Jungian model uh, with there is an inherent beauty to a lot of the uh, archetypal narratives that we utilize in uh, analytical psychology around myths and fairy tales and religion. They wouldn't endure if they didn't also have a beauty to them, as well as being able to speak deeply to our psyches. Mark, using metaphors as a therapeutic tool is something that's definitely in the psychoanalytic canon. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, in your transition from being a clinical psychologist into a more Jungian perspective, how was it that you discovered the therapeutic power of metaphors? When did that dawn upon you? It, it dawned on me implicitly in listening to my supervisor, my primary supervisor, Mel Marshak, and she just had a beautiful way with the language. And I don't think she was intentionally setting out to create metaphors, but inevitably she did in the form of her interpretations. And they seemed almost uh, magical to me initially. And I thought, oh my gosh, this woman's so brilliant. She crafts these interpretations with such care, but not with an over mechanical approach. And they were so alive. And as I listened to her, and then realized, oh, she's got, she's had access to a whole body of literature that I don't have access to or haven't been exposed to. And so I started going into the psychoanalytic literature on interpretation and thinking, oh my gosh, these people are in some sense have a whole different skill set than I've been exposed to in the Jungian world. And so that got me into really thinking deeply about the crafting of words. A little later, I got exposed to a book by a woman named Ella, Ellen Seligman, who was a Jungian analyst called Metaphor and Psychotherapy that came out in the late 80s. And she drew some connections for me of how uh, much psychotherapy is implicitly grounded in metaphor and lifted that up and made it more overt. And then kind of some less direct just developing a deeper interest in poetry and realizing, oh, poetry is mm. all about metaphor, at least the poetry that I really enjoy, particularly a poet named Antonio Machado, who just uses metaphor so beautifully and so fluidly uh, that I didn't even understand that what was what was going on. I just know I was moved by it. Mm -hmm. And so over the last uh, 10, 15 years, I've really tried to make a concerted effort to delve more deeply into the idea of metaphor and how to integrate that into my analytic practice, but just into my daily processing of life. I'm just trying to deepen the work that came before me and bring elements of it a little more saliently into the Jungian world, that the idea that we focus a lot on learning about archetypal patterns, whether that's in myths, fairy tales, religions, alchemy. 
And I realized at some point, oh, these are all meta. Yes, they're mm-hmm. archetypal images, but they're metaphors. And that's another part of why they speak so deeply is that they're speaking in metaphorical language and that there's many sources of metaphor and that if and that the psyche generates metaphors itself that are very idiosyncratically targeted to the individual for example that's dreaming the dream yeah. it's not just stock metaphors that are floating around the culture the psyche the self is inventing metaphors that speak directly to that individual in ways that just astounds me yep. every single day. Yeah. And once I realized that, I'm thinking, oh, this is kind of the umbrella that needs to go over our thoughts about archetypal systems and symbols, but also to listen through a metaphorical ear to the everyday language that people are using and telling us about what's going wrong in their marriage or what's happening on the job. There's all sorts of metaphors that if we can highlight those and pull them out for the individuals and hold them up for observation, they become tools for transformation. Mm -hmm. And, And Mark, following up on that, when you're sitting with someone and you have an interpretation to share and you're crafting it in metaphorical language. What is it that process for you? How do the metaphors occur to you? What, what's going on for you in that moment? Again, I have to go back to Marshak, and she spoke a lot about reverie, and I didn't really understand the word reverie, but the idea that we can enter into a semi-dreamy state if we leave enough space for ourselves in the analytic interaction that we can listen attentively to what's being said, but also in a sense, reserve a part of ourselves that can muse about what's being said in the moment. And out of that dreamy reverie quality, I didn't really understand that at first, but eventually I cultivated the capacity to to do that. Mm. And so there will be little images and pieces that come up I used to, back in you know, the days when I was a candidate in training, I'd be searching for those pieces. You know, I'd be going on a little investigative journey and, and trying to find the right myth or the right fairy tale. And I realized that wasn't, uh, eventually realized that really wasn't getting me where I needed to go in terms of a feeling state of resonance with my patient. It's not a conscious linear process. It's not really a thinking process. Yeah. The, the, the metaphor I use is it's kind of like a big pot of stew. And on the surface, all you see is a little bit of the, the red paste on the top. And, but if you dip the ladle down and you pull the ladle up, you kind of have a little surprise about what's at, in the ladle as you pull it up out of the liquid. And so I kind of think of my reverie like that is Somehow I open up to that reverie and something comes up. Not every time, you know, certainly we can hit still times or dry times, but I've come to really trust that process. And that when I speak out of a reverie, I usually don't speak directly about what's in my reverie. I think about it, digest it a little bit, and I find the bit or piece of it that I think is the most salient piece for that person. And I'll speak it to them almost as if I feel it's true already. Mm. Mark, I wonder if you could create a kind of living vignette around that. So you're there. What are you listening to? What happens in your mind? How do you create the poetry of it? And I realize this is, won't be a particular client, but to give us a sense of what that's like in vivo. Well, I can give a couple of examples of that that are actually published in the book and that I have permission to utilize. So those were, are probably the easiest ones to draw from. One was I was sitting with a person and they were, they were, they were speaking. I don't even remember what they were speaking about, but I had this image of a desert scene. Uh, that came really strongly into my mind. And it had something less to do with 
what they were speaking about and more about how they were speaking about it. Something about the feeling tone of what, how they were speaking. And so rather than saying, oh, I'm having the image of a desert come to mind, does that mean anything to you? Uh, that would be an undigested disclosure. Instead, I said, you know, sometimes when you're speaking, I have the sense that you're out in a very dry space and you've been there for a long time and you're looking around for something to quench your thirst, but nothing is there. I mean, it had a very powerful effect on her. And, you know, who knows what the effect of any one interpretation is, but I could tell that it resonated deeply with this individual. Another uh, example that's also in the book um, was a patient who came in, an older woman who has grandchildren and two adult children, and all of the kids and grandkids were coming to her house for a holiday. And she was worried about that the two children have different kind of guidelines for their kids and how she, particularly around watching TV, and she was worried about um, whether uh, she was going to be able to manage that situation or not. And at first I said in a non-metaphorical way, I just questioned, is that really your responsibility? You know, I'm thinking your children are going to be there too. Why are you the one that feels like you're going to have to be managing? I didn't say all of that. I just asked, is that really your responsibility? And she said, in a very non-salient way, no, I, I guess it's not. That's such a relief. Now, she says the words, but it doesn't, it doesn't really feel like it got anywhere. And I said... You know, it feels like you've been in a watchtower for a long time, surveying the landscape for problems. I wonder if it's time to come down out of the watchtower. Simply with that, she just bursts into tears and sobs, I want to. Oh. And to me, that's the, the most wonderful illustration of what I'm talking about, of the difference between speaking in ordinary prose or speaking in psychological language and speaking in metaphorical language. Yeah. As Edinger says in his book, uh, The Anatomy of the Psyche, concepts don't coagulate. Metaphors and analogies coagulate. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's really great. I'm thinking that um, of your interest in music, Mark, and how how much this process, as you've spoken about it, is putting together both the tune and the lyrics. That's an interesting way to think about it. I hadn't really thought about the tune and the lyrics before, but yeah, that, that's a good analogy. Yeah, you picked up, it that's seems to me, <laughs> mm -hmm. you, picked, you picked up the tune in both of those uh, vignettes that you gave us. And then added the lyrics, and I, I can imagine very much how that brings things together uh, for for the client or for any of us in in human interaction. Yeah, absolutely, and I think it goes very much to the jazz ethos that it there's in jazz, as you know, there there's an underlying chord structure typically that everybody's agreed to play. But how you play it and how you respond to others in that are playing also and make create responses to their musical statements, that's, uh, that's really the essence, I think, of analysis is if we're all improvising jazz musicians and we have some sense of what we want to play, but we also know that it has to be integrated with what others are playing on the stage. Yes, yeah, so it requires this real sensitivity to to the other, and 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 like you're both saying, really just listening to the music. You know, one of the things that that strikes me about this discussion is that the analyst has to really have faith that when he or she drops into that reverie space, mm -hmm. there will mm -hmm. be something there. Yes. When we're beginning, we. Th 
we think, oh, I've got to think about this. I, I, and so the person sitting across from us is talking and we might be thinking, oh, what's, what theory is this or what about this? But you, you don't find the music unless you can let go of the thinking a little bit and find that reverie space in which there is resonance. You know, part of my fantasy about those little vignettes that you just shared is that there was that uh, kind of left-hand contact going on between you and the analysand, that there was an unconscious to unconscious connection that allowed you to correctly intuit what was going on in uh, imagistic language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mark, in one of your papers, you'd mentioned an idea that I think is so important is that metaphors transfer meaning between domains of experience. Mm -hmm. And that's such a dense, substantial idea. I'm wondering if you could unpack that. Oh, yeah. I, I love that idea. And, it, you know, it's not my idea originally, but let's take a, a simple metaphor. The ship's prow plows the sea. So we've got an image of what the ship's prow, the front of the ship, looks like going, cutting through the water. And then we've got an image of what a plow looks like moving through the soil. And so that's a transference of meaning in a simple way, a very simple metaphor, between these two domains, one being in the water and one being on the earth. And yet somehow they're connected. So what we ideally what we do is we take utilized metaphor to make linkages. Okay, a, a big part of Jungian analysis is the idea that the psyche has become dissociated, that it's become splintered into these pockets of energy that we call complexes. And the ideal in Jungian analysis is to create a sense of integration and wholeness. So part of it is being able to not rid ourselves of our complexes, but to integrate them so that they work together in a sense. And we have a greater understanding of the overall narrative that Jung calls the personal myth. That's what we're trying to cultivate. And so these metaphors might link the present to the past, for example, those would be two domains. Or sometimes we're linking the present to the future because Jungian analysis has this teleological, this perspective element. Sometimes we might be linking the feeling tone of a situation, like something that happened in childhood that feels like something that's happening now. And if we can make a linkage through the metaphor, through finding an image that allows the patient to resonate with and experience the similarity between those two things, then sometimes the pain of what's happening in the present is made more understandable. And the pain that occurred in the past is able to be transformed in some way and become part of the larger narrative. Yeah, I'm thinking about uh, this work that was done by Eugene Gendlin. Mm -hmm. And he did this uh, research that showed that improvement in psychotherapy was predicted by how the patient spoke in therapy. Mm -hmm. That if the patient stumbled, groped, looked for words the patient was much more likely to improve than if mm. the patient kind of came in and was able to recite very fluently mm -hmm. uh, what was going on, which is such an interesting finding, and I find myself thinking about that a lot. My imagination about that is that when we can come into the therapist's office and sit down and sort of rattle off our problems, we're really in a thinking space we already know the story. It's maybe kind of a frozen story. But when we come in and when we grow up, we say, well, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's a little bit like this or, uh, you know, and you're groping for words. You're in the realm of that which is not yet formulated. And that's where, that's where change happens. That's where coagulation can happen. Mm-hmm. 
And it seems to me that when I'm sitting with someone who's doing that, part of what I'm doing, hopefully, is lending them my metaphoric imagination. So I may, while they're struggling, be in my own reverie and sometimes come forward with an image that occurs to me very much in this kind of intuitive style and and offer it in much the same way that you spoke about, Mark. Mm -hmm. You know, I think this tremendous, it can have this tremendous impact because it takes something that didn't have a way to be thought about yet. Yeah. And it gives it an image and language. So this actually just happened last night where I was sitting with someone. She's this, you know, fantastically creative woman uh, who has always used her tremendous talents in service to others. And, And now that's starting to shift, but she was talking about working at this job and spending her weekends working on developing new creative potentials for her employer. Mm. And the image that just came to me, because I love fairy tales and I read a lot of fairy tales, so oftentimes my images just come in fairy tale language, which of course fairy tales are metaphorical, is I is Rumpelstiltskin and the miller's daughter toiling over the turning the straw into gold. And um how you know, in the in the beginning of the tale, she has this tremendous creative capacity. I and mean, here's a young woman who can spin straw into gold, but she's doing it in service to her narcissistic father or this cruel king. Mm-hmm. Being able to offer that in some sense releases something. It does coagulate, as you said before, Mark. Yeah, and I think the other thing that metaphor does that's related to what you just said is it doesn't hit them over the head with a hammer. It kind of comes at it obliquely. Uh, David Crosby, the singer-songwriter, I listened to an interview with him one time, uh, and uh, the interviewer said, you know, David, you're so good about writing protest songs that don't protest, that don't sound like protest songs. How do you do that? And he said, very humbly, and David's not a humble person, (laughs) but he said, I learned that from Joni Mitchell. She said to me, if you're going to sing about the Eiffel Tower, don't sing that it's big and strong and made of steel. Sing about the Eiffel Tower peering over the shoulder of your lover on a moonlit night. And I think that's, I mean, certainly there's times that we have to come hard, be confrontational, put pressure in the moment, particularly around when we're really engaging uh, entrenched defense mechanisms uh, and personality characteristics uh, that are rather rigidly held. But most of the time, we're better off coming at it obliquely and not saying so, trying to pin it down in such a precise way because it does leave room for the patient to do something of their own with the metaphor. Well, so a couple things about that. First of all, a metaphor can sneak past the defenses. Exactly. We don't have any defenses against the metaphor. I mean, against metaphor. And uh, there's some really interesting neuropsychological research that uh, I'd like to just briefly mention because it's so powerful. Uh, This guy, Phil Davis, at a university in England, I think the University of Liverpool, he's a Shakespeare scholar, and he kept sitting around thinking, why is Shakespeare so powerful and so enduring? And so he went to the medical school and said, I'd like to study this. How can we do it? And they said, we've got a functional MRI machine. Let's get some subjects and let's put this to a test. And so they got all these subjects to read ordinary prose, like you'd read in a newspaper article or a magazine. And then they had them read passages of Shakespeare. And they could tell in the fMRI machine that the brain is responding in a completely different (laughs) fashion than reading ordinary prose. It's much, the brain becomes much more bicameral. Both sides of the brain are activated and it shifts down from the frontal cortex 
you know, where we do all of our executive function things like planning our grocery list, what, how do I need to get the kids to the doctor and slips down into the more of the emotional processing centers of the midbrain and the lower brain. And he said, metaphor as reflected in Shakespeare's work, because he relies on all sorts of metaphor, particularly grammatical oddities where he's inventing new words and using words that are nouns and turning them into verbs and things like this that are confusing to us, but they also make sense on a metaphorical level. And then they replicated the same study with other metaphorical writers and poets to demonstrate that it's not just Shakespeare. Shakespeare just happens to be particularly good at it. And so it like we you were talking about faith earlier that grounded my faith in what's happening and really gave me this foundation to be this real uh, strong advocate because i know that's what's going on both from a clinical experiential sense and now i have this experimental support uh, around it and there's been other types of neuropsychological studies for example one where they just contrasted two sentences. They had a number of sentences, but I'll just give two. One said, I had a bad day. And one said, I had a rough day. Now, linguistically, those are really in the same ballpark. But rough is a textural metaphor. So as we're hearing that word, the somatosensory cortex of our brain is lighting up like a Christmas tree. Just hearing the word, trans, that one word transforms the impact of the sentence dramatically and the person's involuntary response to it. You can't turn off your response to metaphor no matter how well defended you are because the defenses largely protect the ego. But everybody, all other parts of our psyche all the other listening perspectives that are alive in our psyche are hearing it. And those poor ego defenses don't have much of a chance if we're speaking in a metaphorical language. Now they can close themselves down affectively and reduce the impact of it, but some parts of it still get through. Yeah. I'm thinking about uh, how much metaphor invites us to play. And, and Jung says, uh, I imagine Jung said something about almost everything, but he says, man is completely human only when he's at play. And that th that involves all those parts of us, the, the part that accesses our, our language and feeling and primary process below the level of cognition. Uh, so there's also implicit in it an invitation to join in, an invitation to collaborate. Just in hearing that one sentence, I had a rough day, drops both people below the level of ego, even momentarily. And as you're saying, you know, now we can see on an MRI machine uh, that more parts of us are present Yes, absolutely. And when I'm doing workshops, uh, I've got a workshop I do called Jung in the Metaphorical Mind. And about two thirds of the way through, I stop the formal presentation and we do an experiential set of exercises, things that are actually kind of like improv exercises in acting and comedy. And so I'll give them, I've got a variety of exercises, but it, just an example, I'll give like three words, or I'll give a list of words. And I'll say, okay, pick three words out of this list of words and create uh, a metaphor out of it. And then I'll give them a time frame, you know, and I'll kind of put some time pressure on them. Okay, clock's ticking, clock's ticking. And then as soon as the time ends, I usually start and I'll read whatever I created in that moment to kind of give people, I'm going to put myself out before anybody else to make sure they know that I'm going to participate. And as we go around the room, it is truly play. Everybody laughs. Some, sometimes we cry. 
depending on what words are selected and it just becomes alive and people get a real experience. Sometimes it's fill in the blank type exercises, things like that. And people respond, even when I'm presenting it to a population, uh, the audience is, even speaks a different language, you know, and it's being often being translated. There's still such an aliveness that comes into the room and it's just marvelous that uh, that we and, and essential that we have that experience of playing with metaphor, not approaching it just as an academic exercise, but to develop a comfort. You know, because as, as you know, so many people have re- have reservations about doing something spontaneous, but also doing something that essentially has the air of being creative about it oh, I can't paint, you know, and, or I can't, no, I couldn't write a poem. No, I couldn't write a song. And, you know, my objective there is to say, no, of course you can. And you're going to do it right now. We're going to do it together. We're all going to take risks in this moment. And I would say out of a hundred people, 95 participate. There's very few people that refuse to read what they've written and they all come away feeling oh my god i didn't even know i could do that and of course we need that we we need to be able to have that comfort level when we walk into our consulting rooms there has to be a fluidity and a familiarity of going to that place in order for it to be effective yeah we have to be the change be the model Mm -hmm. If we haven't gone there in our own heads, there's very little chance we'll be able to really enter someone else's internal space. Right. And and they won't, not only will we not be able to enter on an an intuitive level, they won't trust us. Yes. Uh, That takes me back to um, something, Lisa, that you said about the, the dropping down and dropping into, and what you just said, Mark, about risk of that. Uh, I think I just want to acknowledge that it is hard at the beginning for many of us to take that risk, that something inside us will be there and support us. If we engage in reverie, you know, or your improv exercise. Yeah, we we have to find somehow to have this balance between faith in ourselves and faith in our process without becoming arrogant about it. As soon as we fall into that hubris, then we lose all of the all of the juice in that experience. Mm -hmm. But I think faith is faith. we, We don't use the word faith so much in our training. Uh, but I think it's really a useful word that we do have to have cultivate faith in ourselves, faith in our process, faith that we're offering the very best possible uh, approach that we can. So I try to stay up on the research about psychotherapy, particularly psychoanalytic and union therapy that's available out there. Uh, I try to stay aware of developments that are in ancillary fields uh, like neuropsychology, neuroscience, and cognitive science, uh, because those things continue to allow me to speak more and more confidently and feel more and more confident about what it is we do when we're doing it well. Mark, I'm I'm somewhat aware of some of your... Uh, writing and speaking about the effectiveness of psychoanalytic psychotherapy. I think that's that's really important and something that our listeners might want to hear more about. Can you just summarize that really briefly? What does the research tell us about whether or not this works? It, it tells us some really amazing things. And I'm sorry that both Jungian analysts and uh, other schools of psychoanalysis are not as familiar with it as I feel like we should be, because we need to be good advocates for this process, this process of depth psychology, whatever school of thought we come from, we're all focused on accessing and facilitating engagement with the unconscious, no matter what school of psychoanalytic theory you're practicing from. 
And so there's a guy named Jonathan Shedler out of Denver who did this really amazing meta-analysis in 2010 that was pu published in the American Psychologist. And a meta-analysis, for those who are not statistically informed, as I'm sure many people are not, is where you take a bunch, if you don't have enough large-scale studies, enough people in the studies to draw conclusions, there are methods from uh, uh, around being able to compile those uh, multiple studies together and draw inferences based on moving from studies that have maybe 100 people in them, combining them, and then you've got a population of maybe three or four or 5,000 people. And you, there's the conclusions you can draw from a meta-analysis are much stronger than you could draw from the individual studies. Well, what he did was he compiled a lot of those, as well as some other studies of cognitive behavioral therapy, and in particular, cognitive behavioral therapy for depression and psychotropic interventions, medication interventions for depression. And to get FDA approval, you have to have an efficacy rate of about 0.32. They consider that a pretty efficacious medication. Antidepressants have an efficacious rate of about 0.36. So like one, to give you a context, one is a very, very, very strong effectiveness rate. So cognitive behavioral therapy and for depression and antidepressants have an effectiveness rate of about 0.36, 0.38. When he compiles all of these studies of effectiveness of psychoanalytic therapy, which Jungian analysis is a form of psychoanalytic therapy. So that's a broad umbrella term that Jungian work fits under. And he found that psychoanalytic psychotherapy at the conclusion of treatment has an effectiveness rate of about 0.97 to 0.98. Now, there's a couple of interesting caveats. Four months after concluding antidepressant therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, the majority of patients have returned to their baseline level of functioning. Four months. That's you, you get the reprieve during the time of treatment, and four months afterwards, the treatment effect is largely gone. Well, there's several studies that followed people who were in psychoanalytic therapy for a long period of time. And guess what? It doesn't decline. It actually continues to grow after therapy is concluded. So as the three of you know, borderline personality disorder is one of the most difficult disorders to treat. It's the most resistant to treatment. So they did an inpatient psychoanalytic program with these individuals. They had a typical response, and then they had an ongoing program of outpatient psychotherapy for about a year after their inpatient stay. And then they didn't have any further therapy, and they followed them up at eight years the treatment effect size grew from 0.97 to nearly 2.0, which is an enormous in terms of overall life satisfaction, overall subjective feeling of well-being, overall assessment of life functioning, things like that. Those are the kind of things they're measuring. So we have to think, well, what's different? What is different about psychoanalytic psychotherapy? And my conclusion is something that we call the reflective function. Other people call it something called mentalization. A guy named Peter Fonagay in the UK developed this idea, but it's still really the reflective function, which simply means the capacity to reflect on one's experience while you're experiencing it, to process it. To not just, so exa for example, somebody who doesn't have much reflective function might get angry, might think, I'm going to punch that guy and then punch them. There's no synapses in there. There's no 
reflective position in that of, oh, I wonder if I'm going to regret this. I wonder if I might end up in jail because of this. I wonder if I might break my hand because of this. You know, those would be simple reflective functions, but reflective functions nonetheless that then might say, mm, I'm angry, but it's probably better not to punch this person. Well, that is reflective function, and that is something that people who have borderline personality disorder desperately need because they get caught up very much in their emotions and act impulsively out of their emotions and stay in turmoil both internally and in their interpersonal world around them. And so I think that's what all types of psychoanalytic therapy, in particular Jungian analysis, does because Jungian analysis inherently is built around trying to build up the reflective function of understanding what our interior drama is, what informs that interior drama, both in terms of our scripts, but also the affects connected to those scripts and being able to step back from them momentarily and think, oh, that's this thing that we were talking about in therapy last, and it's happening again right now. Right, and that's exactly what Jung meant, I think, when he said we don't solve our problems so much as grow larger than them, or at least that's part of what's implied. Yeah, here. yeah, exactly. The grow larger is the capacity to reflect on them and not be completely in them. He, he uses a, a, a fancy term, circumambulation of the complex, which is simply going around and around the experience of the complex so that you gain a different perspective about it and understand the origins of the complex, how it functions now, and where the complex is taking us if we don't have develop a different relationship with it. Well, thanks. Thanks for that summary. That's just really fascinating. And perhaps... I mean, it, it's so inspiring to me when I started reading that stuff mm -hmm. and still, you know, as you can tell in my voice, still remains mm -hmm. very inspiring to me. Yeah. And, and all of that research was replicated by a guy named Towns a few years later. He got all of the same studies and found exactly the same conclusion. Uh, Mark, I'd like to just take a little pivot and return to this idea of how the clinician mines the metaphoric level within themselves. And of course, then they translate it for the client. Uh, in your paper on the use of metaphor, you mention Jung's experience putting together the black books and the red book and, and reflect on his deepening and use of metaphor. This is a question that often comes up among analysts in training, how does one technically fall into a useful reverie? And what's your theory about what Jung was pragmatically doing to get himself into these states of consciousness where these figures became autonomous? Yeah, I could speak a little bit to that. Uh, it's important to remember that Jung didn't have a choice. The period where he's doing the black books, where he's actually writing in the black books is from 1913 to 1916. So historically, 1913 is one year after he published his book, Symbols of Transformation, that he knew was going to create a rift with Freud. And at the time, he was the president of the International Psychoanalytic Association. Other than Freud, he was the top person in the field of psychoanalysis. He was also one of the editors, along with Freud and Eugene Beloyler, his boss at the Berkholtzli, of the uh, yearbook for psychoanalysis, which was the very first psychoanalytic journal in existence. His book, Symbol of Transformation, was severely criticized and condemned and he withdrew from the International Psychoanalytic Association, both the presidency and membership. He withdrew from the editorship of the yearbook, and he went into a personal and professional isolation in which he was actively decompensating and hallucinating. 
and he had he felt he had no other choice but to fall into the abyss. Uh, and the black books were really his self uh, therapy as a way of engaging and metabolizing all of those experiences. So he they came on him. He didn't have to prepare himself. He was already in it and didn't have a choice but to try to find a way not out but into it and to understand it and who, in a sense, integrate it. So it came out of necessity. Uh, later on, he did do a lot of work around different types of meditation and kundalini yoga that I think facilitates uh, that sort of process. And active imagination, too, is, a, is very similar to reverie, except that with active imagination, as Jung lays it out, you've got kind of more of an agenda of engaging with specific figures from the unconscious often that appear in your dreams. And so there, you kind of go into it trying to engage more deeply with something that's happened in a dream often. And, but any, any state like that, any altered state or semi-altered state is going to put you into the same mind frame that facilitates reverie. Now, for me, uh, it didn't happen quite so dramatically, and it was more, I feel, a cultivation of that space over time. And for me, poetry was really uh, an avenue into cultivating that space of reading and sitting with poems and really letting the metaphor in the poem impact me. And somehow that activity and listening to music, I think really engaging with any art form, whether it's visual, whether it's dance, uh, whether it's classical music, for me, it seems to be an aesthetic avenue that allows me to cultivate the conditions for that. So when I'm exposing myself intentionally and with some degree of joy to those things on a consistent basis, it feels like that reduces the interior barriers to those things coming up. So my practice is one of aesthetic engagement. And then I see that carry over into my work in the consulting room. What strikes me is that each of us has a particular temperament, even if we think about it in terms of the primary and secondary functions, mm -hmm. and that each person dances around trying to find their gate into that state, whether it's poetry or kundalini yoga, meditation, perhaps other kinds of tools or um, technology to try to get to that. Yeah, and I think if we think about not what should we be doing, like what practices should we be doing? Really, we should do any practice that disengage our frontal lobe processing. Mm -hmm. uh, I was listening to an interesting podcast about this guy who he does research on the evolutionary impact of alcohol. <laughs> and uh, he says that, uh, yes, there are certainly destructive elements, but that there, there's a fine line, which is basically a blood alcohol level of 0.08, which is probably just at the edge of legal capacity to drive. And he, he's done a lot of research around this. And he says that's where we really hit our creative sweet spot. And that if it's it, it, we're, that we, what happens is it sufficiently disengages our frontal lobes so that we have more access to what Deb mentioned about primary process thinking. And so it's kind of like an, a little bit of an artificial way of getting to that space. So if you can think about being in your consulting room at a blood alcohol level of 0.08, without actually needing to ingest the alcohol. That's kind of the state, if you can imagine that semi-warm, kind of flowing, you don't really have too much of an agenda. You know, you're not trying to figure out 
solve the problem, but things start appearing to you. You know, it's not a good state for editing, but it's a great state for writing, for example, is what this author argues. And he's got a lot of uh, interesting research, both uh, physiologically and anthropologically, to support his argument. So I think that, that that's kind of a, a semi-humorous way of saying that that's kind of what we're, where we're trying to get is where we can hold things loosely and let things happen and trust what's happening. That's, that's the sweet spot that we're looking for. And if we're, it, it's hard to get there sometimes sitting up with a person who wants to make a lot of visual connection, eye to eye connection, because to some extent that you start responding to their social cues, nonverbal social cues and they start responding to ours, even ones we're unaware of making. It's more easy with somebody who can tolerate breaking gaze. And it's easier if somebody is reclining on an analytic couch as their session. It's much easier to enter reverie both for them and for me. And there's a, a reason for that. Again, neuropsychologically, we've got two primary modes that our brain orients in. And one's called the task-specific mode, and that's when our frontal lobes are actively engaged and we're planning. We're trying to figure something out. We're looking at a map. We're trying to figure out how to get to uh, Savannah, Georgia, or whatever. And then there's another mode, entirely different, called the default mode network, where we kind of go semi-offline and we're in that dreamy state and they can really demonstrate that no matter what kind of work you're doing, if you stay in task-specific mode, that work, whether you're trying to solve high-level theoretical math problems or whether you're trying to paint a, pic a painting, if you stay in task-specific mode too long, both your productivity and your creative relationship to the material starts to drop off dramatically. So these scientists that stay 18 hours in the lab eventually reach a point of diminishing returns and they need to find a way to go into that default mode network. So now, uh, you know, like all these tech companies have these playrooms, you know, where they've got ping pong, they've got video games, they've got pinball machines. And this is a way of culturally supporting shifting from task specific mode into default mode network. They've got bean bags and things like this that facilitate reclining. When we lay on the grass and look up at the clouds and start to try to name the cloud, what images we see in the clouds, we're almost always shifting into default mode network because there's no particular agenda other than to be playful about these images. Mark, I have a, a follow-up question about this ability to drop into reverie and find their source. So no matter what, you know that if you just trust, you'll drop and you'll see something. Do you find that the generativity of your unconscious alters depending on the person you're sitting with? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, we've, we've got a concept, as you know, in analysis called projective identification. And for those listeners who are not familiar with that, we all project. We all put things on to other people based on how we're, we're put together internally. And so we have expectations that we shouldn't have of people. Um, we make assumptions about how people are that are really based more in us than others. So that's projection projective identification in which there's a subtle unconscious interaction that not only where the patient is projecting something onto us, they're subtly interacting with us in a way that begins to shape our response. That can come in a variety of forms, but one of the things it can do is, for example, become an internal obstacle to our own reverie process. If our reverie process feels dangerous to them, not because they think we're going to say something outlandish, 
but because they're afraid that we'll say something that will allow them to change, then there's unconscious processes, unconscious defenses, which projective identification is one, then begins to interfere with the analyst's ability to go to that place. Similarly, we might have what's called a counter-transference reaction to somebody in which something from our own history uh, becomes an obstacle to having a resonance with that person. Like if they remind us of the teacher that we were really felt embarrassed by in school and there's something about them that resonates. And then we might feel unconsciously vulnerable and shut down that reverie space because going into reverie and sharing something from that with another human being is inherently vulnerable feeling. And so that it it can be both projective identification, but it can also be our own counter transference that shuts that reverie process down because on some level it feels too dangerous. You know, everybody comes to therapy wanting to change. But also a certain part of our psyche is there to maintain the status quo, to maintain the homeostasis. And so there's always what I call individuation forces at play. And there's also anti-individuation forces at play. And so part of the person is trying to get on board and the other part is trying to cut bait and run. And we all, we're all subject to that. I mean, I know, I know. <laughs> from my own analysis that there are plenty of things that I could have done better to facilitate my own process. And so I'm subject to the same things as all of my patients. I think I want to circle back to something that maybe Deb, you were talking about it earlier, just right in the beginning is the importance of beauty and how metaphorical language evokes something that's beautiful, that's transcendent, that it brings us into a wider realm. And so when we share an interpretation with a patient that is informed by metaphor, it's really ennobling of the person's suffering. There a couple of ideas come to mind. One is a Bionian analyst named Judith Mitrani, and she's got this wonderful paper called Taking the Transference. And uh, she says, so often we interfere with the patient's therapy process by wanting and trying to be the good object in our own desire to be the good object, seen in the good light, be the good therapist. And too often we fail to take up the patient's need to encounter the bad object, but the bad object that can hear and respond in a different way than their previous bad objects. So to take on, you know, if somebody's angry with us, to take that seriously and to try to not convince them that, no, that's not what you intended to do by saying that, to, to acknowledge that they're hurt by what you said, but not try to explain it away. So that's one way that we can be uh, ennobling of our patients. Then uh, there's this guy named uh, Jerome uh, Ormland who wrote this uh, interesting book about interpretation. And he said, a well-crafted interpretation is, is the most, the least regressive, most affirming statement we can give them because we're in a sense treating them as equal partners in the process. And so, yes, metaphor fits into the same avenue. And this aesthetic element of it is part of what gives it its power. Not like thinking about what pretty words can I say to the patient, but the metaphor itself has an inherent beauty to it. Yes. And I'm thinking how much this relates to telos of the growing bigger than our problems, because it's such an invitation. It's attractive. It treats the person, um, as you said, Mark, like an equal. It's what you said. It's ennobling, uh, Mm -hmm. Lisa. Uh, It invites the person to play. It sneaks past 
uh, ego defenses and and inherently uh, pulls pulls us forward into a new way of being. I don't know what everybody's opinion is, but often, you know, we get stereotyped as, oh, we're the ones that listen, or we're the ones that are empathic, or we, we're the ones that say soothing things. And yes, of course, all of those things have to be present to a degree, but they're the necessary milieu for other things to occur. They're not in and of itself the, the transformative element. There has to be this in tuned relational capacity. And that sets the stage for these other things like interpretation, like confrontation. It's the necessary milieu for those things to take place. And and as Jung actually says, um, every interpretation is an affront to the ego. You know, whether we're saying it in a confrontational style, but what he's saying is the ego has its perspective that it wants to keep (laughs) <laughs> about the way things are. And so every time we speak from a different vertex that's outside the ego's concerns, that's an affront to the ego. But it might be a partnering with the self. Right. Or a partnering with an unheard part of the psyche, a complex that needs to be heard and listened to. So it, one of the things I say is, you know, when I'm supervising is a lot of initially when we're in training, we, we direct a lot of comments, I think, to the ego. And the task is learning how to speak beyond the ego to the other sectors of the personality that have completely different concerns than the ego does. So there's a beautiful, uh, oh, I'm going to, I'm sure I'm going to block on the Harold Searles, who was a master of working with psychotic patients. And it's such a beautiful story. I'm going to, I'm already getting teary thinking about the story I'm about to tell. But he did a book with Robert Langs called The Interpersonal Interpersonal and Intrapsychic Dimensions of Psychotherapy. And he has some verbatim transcripts of his analysis with this woman who was in a residential psychiatric treatment facility. And this was prior to antipsychotic medications. Mrs. Douglas is her name. He, he sees her multiple times a week. And so he knows exactly her situation, that she's in this residential facility and that she does not have a dog. But she comes in one day and she says, oh, I'm wondering if I should bring my dog to the session. And Searles being able to swim in metaphor and psychic reality does not bat an eyelash. He doesn't say, well, Mrs. Douglas, you don't have a dog. You're here in this facility and uh, that's not possible. He simply says, oh, I don't know. What kind of dog is it? And she tells him and he says, well, how big is your dog? And she says, oh, about this big, about 18 inches long. He says, oh, so not so big that it would create a disruption to our session. And she says, oh, no, no. And then he says, well, why do you think your dog wants to come to the session? <laughs> and he, she says, well, he's sad. Oh. And he says, oh, really? How sad is he? And she says, well, he wants to die. <sighs> And then he simply says, oh, well, he must certainly come to the session then. Mm. I mean, how beautiful Mm. is that? I mean, Mm. it is so touching and so lovely, so beautiful, so empathic, uh, and yet so casual Mm. at the same time. that's That's a beautiful story. I mean, I've been reading that that case and using it as an illustration for nearly 20 years. And it literally brings tears to my eyes every single time. Yeah. Yeah. All of you is welcome here. Even your most distraught, disturbed, sad parts. Right. 
And then, then she already knows something immediately. She doesn't know what the dog is. She doesn't differentiate, but she knows exactly what you just said on an intuitive level. And that's what allowed the work to continue to go forward. That's, that's beautiful. And I wonder if this might be a good place to switch to a dream. Okay. Another uh, example of beautiful metaphorical language. Hey, Lisa, what's been going on about your book? Well, it was released on May 25th, and sales have been strong. And I've been receiving so many lovely emails and texts and phone calls from from friends and from uh, people that I don't know telling me how much they've enjoyed the book. And so that feels really great. The reviews on Amazon have all been glowing, and that's been really heartening. It's just really wonderful to know that this project of mine is resonating with so many people. I'm just uh, so happy for you, and it's such a lovely, lovely book, both deep and accessible, about the inner journey around being a mother. It's never been, that's never been written about. It hasn't been out there. And that it's getting such an enthusiastic, heartfelt reception. It's wonderful. Yeah, I would love it if listeners who've read the book could write a review on Amazon because <laughs> although there are many wonderful ones there, um, more is always better. So thanks in advance for that. You've really incarnated something that was in the ethers that needed to be pulled down, needed to be shaped in words, and needed to be made accessible. And the proof in the pudding is that it's beginning to have a kind of life of its own in the collective. <laughs> yes. That speaks a lot to the timeliness of this. Yeah, I think you're right, Joseph. The, the analogy to a baby is just too rich and too good and too multifaceted to be <laughs> missed. <laughs> it's having a life of its own, which yeah. is just what we want. Mm. Our dream today is submitted by a 45-year-old male who works as a pathologist. And here's the dream. I'm in the bathroom of a hotel room where I'm staying. I may have just gotten out of the shower. I see a fat, red, slimy, worm-like creature several inches in length crawling along the floor. I'm horrified and think that it is a snake. As I inspect it more closely, I notice a tiny pair of limbs along the upper portion of its body. At this point, I wonder if it is a baby alligator. I find this idea less repugnant than a snake. My wife comes into the room and tells me that it is actually a bird. As I study the tiny limbs, I begin to think that these must be embryonic wings. At this point, I begin to ponder how I should nurture this creature, wondering if it would be best for it if I took it outside. He gives us a bit of context, writing, I am mid-career and grateful for the work, but no longer find it inspiring. I've been married for nine years and have no children. Our marriage is loving, but generally lacking in passion. His feelings in the dream were at first horror and revulsion, then calmer curiosity, and finally a sense of obligation to tend to the needs of this helpless creature. And he adds, The dream reminded me of a childhood experience of turning over a rock and being horrified by a strange-looking and fast-moving worm. My uncle informed me that it was a salamander, and at that point, I noticed its tiny legs and was fascinated. Well, the first thing in my mind is thinking about Jung's dream of the phallus, um, just moving around inside of me, that he was a very young boy and had this dream that he was in an underground chamber and sitting on a throne was a great towering worm-like creature, and he also was afraid that it would slither off onto the ground and find him. So I'm associatively thinking about the phallic 
connotations of the dream, although it does seem like it's moving in a different direction ultimately. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that it starts off slimy and worm-like. Then he thinks it's a snake, right? So we've gone to an invertebrate to a vertebrate, and then it's a then it's you know maybe some kind of lizard like an alligator, and then it's a bird. So there there's almost some kind of evolutionary uh, developmental trend at work or something. So the, a couple of the things that struck me about the dream, I think it's powerful. I will say that over the years, I've become more and more focused on the experience of the dream as opposed to the interpretation of the specific dream elements. You know, so it is difficult for all of us, in a sense, to interpret a dream autonomous of the dreamer. So with that little caveat, you know, this evolutionary thing you're speaking about, I think for me is the prospective element of the dream, where the dream is carrying the dreamer to, particularly this idea of embryonic wings, you know, and the the association that wings give flight. And that on some, you know, if we think about it alchemically, that he's a bit coagulated. He's too near the earth. He's too grounded in his orientation to life. You know, I think a path, being a pathologist certainly lends itself to that of the examination of disease process and tissues, right? So that, that's one thing. But I also think that's what, what is in this dream is an example of an emerging capacity for reflective functioning, because there's a lot of emphasis in the dream around he at first he notices one thing and then he notices it's something else and then he notices it something else and then his wife comes in and says no i think it's this other thing and so there is this evaluative capacity to think about what he's seeing that's reflected in the and to reevaluate what he's seeing which is an important part of the reflective function and the last thing i'll, I'll I'll say at this point is uh, the, the image of the linking, particularly between, in this case, between dream and in his association, he has a specific memory from childhood. So there's right in that process, you can see the linking, the connecting going on between the dream and his historical memory even though we know that the historical memory is in some ways a subjective historical memory rather than a factual one. Well, and, and picking up on that, the childhood experience was uh, alarm or disgust or something, and then he became fascinated when his uncle told him that it was a salamander. And that is recapitulated in this dream, that at first he's uh, alarmed, he's disgusted, but then he becomes increasingly interested and his attitude change. And and I, I think that for me, this is one of the most important things about this dream is what it says about the dreamer's attitude toward the unconscious. Mm-hmm. That at first, this new content from the unconscious is reviled. Maybe he's a little bit uh, alarmed by it. But by the end, there's curiosity and a desire to tend to it. And it's almost like we can imagine that it changes as a result of his changed capacity to turn toward it with curiosity. What I'm thinking about as the sort of turning point in in this progression that you're both uh, articulating uh, is his wife. So uh, here is the feminine uh, aspect in his waking world life, um, imaged as his wife, but his own internal feminine or anima that then says it might actually be a bird, which is often associated with with spirit, Um, just leaving that grounded uh, element that you mentioned, Mark, and uh, something that is of a very different order of experience and maybe taking it outside, a place that is more natural, more open, more possibility uh, than his tight, perhaps too tight, tendency to contain. 
or we might even play with the uh, inner outer metaphor of an, an interior experience that needs to be exteriorized. Just as Jung said, uh, there's mm -hmm. a reason uh, for asking patients to paint paintings or make sculptures or create dances or go play with the stones at the edge of the lake is that it, it, it exteriorizes an interior process, not through projection, but being able to recreate it in a concrete way that then allows deeper engagement with the image. I'm caught by the idea that what he's becoming aware of is embryonic and developing, and that whatever this nascent and emergent part of his psyche is carrying is at first horrifying to him. And how often in midlife, that really is how we respond to the demand of the unconscious that is not congruent with the way we've been living in the first half. So at 45, his career is not so great, his marriage is a little lackluster, and something is now alive inside of him that he doesn't quite know how to relate to. And I think just as you had said, Deb, that the appearance of the wife, perhaps an anima figure, grants him this, at least an idea that this needs to be tended and that there is some kind of value in it, if for no other reason, that it's a living thing. So this idea that there's something alive in him, which is wildly alien and evokes kind of primal affect still is valuable. And that makes the dream feel really propitious. And I think, um, like to approach the wife initially of letting her remain external and to ask the dreamer, why do you imagine your wife would be able to see that it was a bird and you weren't? To let him continue to play with his wife imaginally as the carrier of this information, but also to wonder what is it that she might see, what eyes might sh she have to see with that in some way is undeveloped or lacking in him. And then he might be able to begin to identify those qualities that he identifies in his wife and be more open to claiming those as something about him. Mm, that's really nice. You know, I think there's always room. Uh, I'm dating myself naturally, but there was a show called Columbo when I was growing up mm -hmm. with Peter Falk. And he always walked around with his head on his hand saying, now, 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 let, let me ask just one more question. <laughs> yes. You know, he was always playing the dumbling, mm -hmm. but yes. he also always had an agenda behind being the dumbling. So even though I might have ideas about why, what he may need to own, concept, uh, internalize about his wife, I kind of want to play the dumbling a little bit around the wife and get him to ponder the qualities of his wife in a different way. In addition to the idea of it links the past with the present and therefore crosses domains, but also that his uncle in the memory, his panic, of his horror about the animal, the, the salamander, diminished as soon as the uncle named it. So often I think this is what we're doing is we're naming unfamiliar things yeah. and giving them a, a, a container through the naming, just as uh, the Miller's daughter finds a way to contain the kind of the negative energy of Rumpelstiltskin when she finally discovers his name. Uh, yes. Uh, and so, like, I've had several patients who came in, initial consultations, telling me, I think I'm going crazy really crazy. It's really scaring me. You know, and I'll say, well, well, tell me about that. Tell me about what feels crazy. And then they'll go into it. I'll say, you know, I'm not sure if you're aware of this diagnosis, but it's called obsessive compulsive disorder. And then I'll run down the checklist of things that obsessive compulsive people do and feel. And they'll say, oh my God, oh my God, I thought I was going crazy. So this is a thing, right? And I'll say, yeah, this is a thing. It's a thing. And immediately they shift their position from 
I'm so terrified to, oh, this is something I need to work with, right? When you've named something, you can have a relationship with it. Right. Yeah. And right. We, can, we can recognize or recognize it. Right, because we know that the greatest terror is not the monster we can see, that the, but the monster that we can't see. And horror film makers often rely heavily on that. So there was a, a movie a few years ago called The Mist, where we never see ever the thing. It's in the mist the whole time. We see its effects, but we never see the monster. And so I, I think that's a big part of what we do is we don't explain it away. We don't normalize. Oh, everybody feels that way. That's typically not helpful. Uh, but when we can give them a pattern, an image, or something that comes from one of their dreams that helps them organize their relationship to the material and give it a name or a face or a body, then that's what helps them metabolize because it makes the unknown known. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, Help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.